Welcome to Baltic World. I'm Charlene. I'm Crispin. This is our week in review. Baltic World is a premier channel. We discuss important issues facing Northern, Central and Eastern Europe. But before we begin, how are you, Crispin? I'm good. The new year seems to be starting well in terms of Baltic World. Mm. Uh, we had some wonderful feedback on our second book review. Yes. Not least of which is from the author herself, Ruta Sapites. I'll read it out to you. It's clear that she watched the whole thing too. Uh, it says, Thank you. Such a thoughtful review and discussion, especially about Krasetsky and the nature of cruelty. And if you watch that video, you say we do actually spend some time talking about Krasetsky. Uh, other Baltic themed books I'd recommend... Non-fiction are Shadows in the Tundra, on the Shadows on the Tundra, forgive me, Bloodlands, mm. Among the Living and the Dead, and for fiction, Purge by S. Uh, Oksanen. So we'll look up um, Purge and, and see. And then, so thank you very much, Ruta, for, for that. Uh, uh, it was very great that you watched the whole thing. It, the book, of course, was Between Shades of Grey. Go and check out that review if you haven't already. Mm. Uh, I do have some spoiler talk. On that book. So in that review, we try really hard to we talk about the characters in detail and and the overarching synopsis, but we don't go into great spoilers. Yeah. And there's something that I, I allude to in that video, uh, which is a question you asked Charlene as to how I would end things. Oh uh, yeah. Now, so how I would have ended it? Spoilers. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll get Charlene to chuck in a timestamp. Um, for when it's safe to listen again. But spoiler talk on this. If I was writing Between Shades of Grey, I would have had Lena end up with Krasetsky. Uh, so, Why? Because it's it would invoke complicated emotions in the reader, right? Because okay. Krasetsky is abusive, right? He's taken her out to Siberia. Yeah, threw uh, a can at her face. Th- exactly, gave him a scar on the forehead, all that sort of stuff. But, but as we say, he's not naturally cruel. Mm. Uh, and Lena's mother, Elena, obviously gets through to him mm. um, and has a different type of relationship with him that we don't see. Mm. And so when and- it, it, I would have had it gradually revealed how Lena begins to see him through her mother's eyes, if you know what I mean. Right. So, Because Elena kind of gets information from Krasetsky throughout the book. Like she's always talking to him about trying to find more information about um, her husband. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's the only time, oh, that's the only way for her to understand like whether he's alive or not is through Krasetsky, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Um, uh, so so Nikolai Krasetsky becomes this mm. this avenue and it's a deep exploration in the human soul. Mm. And so it throws up all these complicated things like, because uh, from a modern sort of Me Too 2021, 2022 perspective, mm. you'd be like, he's an abusive NKVD guard. How could you possibly have the, the main protagonist end up with him? Mm. Uh, and I think that that would be the most, most challenging be like okay he, he's done some terrible things but that's not who he is mm. uh and elena clearly can see this and has developed a relationship with him on this basis and lena resents her mother yeah. because of that relationship so if you take this one step further where lena goes through a development of of seeing the complexity of the human soul and starts to see krasetsky in a different light Right. Uh, then I could see them ending up together uh, in, in a relationship. I could, I could see that and then becoming a perfectly healthy, positive thing where both of them grow and both of them learn and they become great partners. And so I would have had perhaps something tragic happen to Andreas uh, and and have Lena end up with Krasetsky or, mm. or for... Um, well, we need to know Krasetsky a bit more because I, I don't think we got enough of his character in the book for us to <laughs> see how they're suited together. I mean, like, yeah, that, I mean, that's just your... Um... Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, we see the abrupt ending where yeah. uh, all of a sudden a doctor shows up who apparently was a real person. A doctor shows up and everything changes and they all get, like, liberated. Mm-hmm. Whereas what I would have liked to have seen is uh, in that third act, Lena get to know Krasetsky a bit more because they're stuck in the middle of Siberia together. It's like literally nothing else. Like no, like mm. Krasetsky has less oversight because he's 
not where lots of other NKVD people are, who's at the far end of the world. So yeah. you can get to know him a little better. And I would have had it so that Lena is part of that journey and she starts to see the NKVD and these Russians not just as black and white evil mus you know muscle turning villains. Yeah. Stop seeing snakes come out of the walls and stuff. Yeah. And starts to see them as people who are complex and damaged and and with real problems and mm. uh and reach out across that that sort of victim oppressor divide uh, and develop a real human connection. Now, I would that that would have been an incredibly brave uh, and terribly dangerous direction to take the book, um, and it's something that I think would have made it much less palatable to be in Baltic you know, high schools and things like that. Like, like there'd be a lot more controversy around a text like that. Mm. But I think done right, uh, uh, it still would have been a better story uh, than, you know, she ends up with Andreas happily ever after um, because that there, there's something intrinsically human and believable about that, um, which and would have and would cause the reader to question some of their own assumptions. Like, it, What's that syndrome called again when you're like fall in love with your captor? Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah. Is that it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, but that's not... It, it, it's, I mean, that, that, that you, could, you could say that. And this is the thing. You would have people debating the book much more. Like you don't... I don't see many online debates about this book. I see a lot of praise for this book mm. uh, and a lot of, uh, you know, this is a very under-researched, underdeveloped part of fiction and, and history. Uh, and uh, it's true. Like, it really is. And it really fills that need and it does it superbly. Um, but I really like it when when people are, hate a book, right? And not because the writing's bad or the story's bad, but they just don't like the message it gives. Um, and that... I would I'd feel better uh, having written a book that he had furious defenders and furious critics rather than something that was universally loved and praised. Mm. Um, because if you get, if you dig into that side of, of people where they have a visceral emotional reaction to what they're reading, yeah. then you have actually achieved something. You've reached that person on a human level. Mm. Uh, and so even though this book would not be as universally accepted as it is um, because the ending is so safe. I personally, this Christmas perspective, not, you know, literary critic, but Christmas perspective would be if Lena ended up with Krasetsky and you would need to extend that third act a bit more, which I think was needed anyway, so as that she could start to see the way Alina saw Nikolai mm. And then developed her own relationship with Nikolai, and that, re and then she realised that she actually was falling in love with the guy. Mm -hmm. Then it would have been, if done right and responsibly, would have been a, a great ending. That's my view, Christmas perspective. Yeah. Um, mm. Just yeah. even listening to you, I'm like challenged. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what else was the question? You know, like, you know, what if it, that ending didn't happen? Then. Then the what book would probably wouldn't have the impact it's had because, the like a lot of teachers and a lot of schools and a lot of curriculums, would have been like, mm, can we really have this book as part of our mandatory text? Yeah. So I understand from that perspective why it's that's not the ending. Yeah, because there are other themes that the book kind of wanted to focus on more, right? Like the deportation and like all the other parts. Well, the, the greatest political theorist of the 20th century, in my opinion, is Hannah Arendt. In fact, I talked about her in the very first video we ever published on uh, YouTube. Mm. And one of the things that she says is that terrible traumatic things, and she was talking about the Holocaust, but this I think is definitely on par with that, doesn't just influence the victim, but it also influences the oppressor. Uh, and I think that Krasinski is the most complicated character in the story, uh, rightly so. And uh, although I didn't like, again, sticking with the spoilers, I didn't like the fact that he was half Polish and that uh, you know he therefore was sympathetic because he, he, wasn't. Was, he wasn't proper Russian. 
I, I didn't like that, as I said in, in the previous thing. I think it would have been much better for him to have been an idealistic communist mm. who believed, who had signed up to the Communist Party and was like, NKVD, yes, I'm going to make this new utopia. Mm. And they just realised how thing badly it was spinning out of control and, and then had that cognitive dissonance between what he had believed and what he was physically seeing mm. and that clash becoming too much and breaking him as a person. I think that would have been a... Uh, uh, compelling whereas be like oh he's secretly hated this the whole time and he's only doing it because you know his father expects it the father he hates i was just like come on this is not it's not realistic right well it's realistic but it's not it's not a sophisticated human story you know like he's he's always been this kind of internal rebel hating everything and like okay well then you've taken away some of the the story arc like he's always been that way. He's mm. just been kind of, he hasn't had anyone able to kind of bring that out, you know, and sort of say, oh, yes, I actually hate being in Russia and I hate this sort of Russian mm. side. Um, I feel much more Polish, et cetera. Yeah, yeah and I've realised that there could have been an opportunity for them to develop a relationship, especially when he had, um, Lena had to draw up pictures mm. and do a portrait of them and like they could have had a conversation of something. It wouldn't, like, using, instead of using that, sil- um, having silence throughout. Um, that those scenes is to yeah have a conversation about like exploring the why or like how and I don't know maybe that's not realistic I'm not sure <laughs> like um, yeah or or when like I actually think it would have been a great catalyst so when he throws that can at uh, Lena and cuts her and everything mm. for him to like clearly be traumatized by what he's done like to to because we don't see that true in the book. Uh, if he had realised that he wasn't who these people want him to be, and if that if that was the moment where he realised that he was hurting someone but he was really hurting himself mm. uh, and one of the reasons he was hurting himself is because he was covering up feelings he had for this person that he wasn't supposed to feel affection for mm. um so that that and that is a very human thing like i remember in uh like grade four when i was a kid there was this girl that liked me right and uh, she was really like and she behaved to me visibly different to the way she behaved to, to the other boys and then so and and she did this out, out in like the public kind of field mm. right and my friends were like laughing because you know oh she likes you blah 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 and they were making fun of me and i was then embarrassed by the fact that this girl liked me so i said something really insulting to this girl and made her cry right now wow (laughs) yeah no but like i i can i can i can remember this and it was totally antithetical to what i would have done had this happened in any other context other than being in public among people with people laughing at me uh, and me wanting to to avoid that embarrassment and humiliation and then projecting that onto this girl who was a wonderfully gorgeous girl and uh, who had done me absolutely no harm mm. um, uh, simply to shift that embarrassment and to impress my friends, right? Mm. Uh, and I can imagine, and, and so when I see this instance with Krasinski of like him hurling this can at, at Lena's head, you ask yourself the question, would he have done that if he wasn't with his NKVD buddies? Mm. And all the evidence we have is that the answer is no. That absolutely, like, he just wouldn't be in his nature to even consider that. Mm. But because he's been socialised and feels a need to impress, uh, I mean, another great story that uh, people should read is George Orwell's The Elephant. That is a, an essay. It's a real life essay. He'd been recalling a time when he was a colonial sort of constable in Burma um, for the British Empire. And there was this moment where, uh, like long story short, he has to kill an elephant, right? Mm-hmm. He has, And he collects his elephant gun. And as soon as he picks up the gun, he realizes later that he had made his decision then and there to, to shoot the elephant because everybody sees the the white kind of British guy pick up the gun and he's only like 20, right? Yeah. Uh, and they a crowd gathers and, and like 2,000 people gather 
to see this white man shoot this elephant, right? And there's this expectation. And he know and then he sees the elephant. And then he realizes instantly that he shouldn't kill this elephant. It's just it's like eating grass, right? Uh, and then he realizes that if he doesn't shoot the elephant, he's gonna be laughed at by these thousands of people that have come out to see that him shoot yeah. the elephant. That's the thing that they've come to see. Um, so I won't, you know, obviously reveal the, the answer, but it's just there is so much that men do in particular, and women too, but I think men more so, because their male friends or their the avoidance of public humiliation, which is out of character for that person. And I remember that instance when I was in grade four. It was out of character for me to publicly humiliate this girl um, because I was being laughed at. I should have shrugged off the fact that I was being laughed at and being nice to this girl and, and screw the other guys, like, it's fine. Um, mm. And, you know, I remember that, that moment of, of shame, um, even though I was a young boy myself and it's totally understandable. Um, mm, yeah. And I think with Krasinski, I think it's very much the, the same light. Um, and I think if, if Lena had developed that understanding, mm. then... It would have um, it would have been quite a story. Um, yeah, interesting point, especially at Lena's age, where you know she's still discovering herself, and you know at that age, you're a teenager, you always care about what other people think of you. <laughs> always, when you're a young person, you, you know you don't get to like your twenties and your thirties. Like, actually, people's opinions don't matter. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so I guess that's all I have to really say about that. And yeah, especially when in year four, you can think of that time when, yeah, other people's opinions felt like they mattered the world to you. And then you're like, hmm, actually. So I also want to thank everyone for commenting on our book review video, uh, especially answering my queries of like, why, why bother, you know, having, uh, rounding up all the Lithuanians sent in Siberia and work them like slaves. Um, particularly uh, response from Codin, I might, Butcher this. Codilonostinoza? Uh, I feel like it's like... I just say Codal. <laughs> when Codal. I mentioned it. Really? You, you've got a very long screen name. Um, uh, Codilodinoza. Yeah. Codilodinoza. Codilodinoza. Um, it's probably a tongue twister. Yeah. I think it is a tongue twister. But mm. I found that um, incredibly insightful. Especially, you know, yeah, it, it does make sense to having to be based on free labor <laughs> at that time and re-education you know in order to have followers you need to indoctrinate have, indoctrinate mm. exactly that word mm. um but in saying that moving on uh do you want to well yes we have some uh thank yous and welcomes oh, um okay. so new patreon members have signed up we've got some uh va who comments a bit thank you so much for joining thanks va uh martinez baris does uh i hope i've got that right thank you very much for your contribution and paul velas thank you as well uh we are still like give us give us a few more weeks and we will have sorted out the types of rewards we want mm -hmm. to give um patreon subscribers uh in the meantime if you have any requests uh, I read the Patreon messages straight away and I get back to them the same day usually. Uh, so if you if there's something you want to hear about from us, uh, let us know and we will cover those topics um, and we'll give obviously priority to the people making these contributions. But we'll look at something that's a little bit more structured. Mm -hmm. We're not used to Patreon. So we look at what other content creators are doing and figuring out what's best fit for the channel uh, so as that we can reward that contribution, but while maintaining, obviously, you know, a constant flow of good content for everybody. Uh, so mm. hopefully we will we'll be able to lay that out in the next few weeks. Um, that's one of the kind of early uh, New Year's resolutions for Baltic World. Mm. To that end, uh, one person, Vitutus, did forward me the Lithuanian Foreign Policy Review, which I mentioned in the last video. Uh, it is a really interesting publication and it comes out once a year. It's only just been published for 21-22, so as of December. And it's edited by a Linus Coyola uh, of uh, the Eastern European Study Centre. So that's who I presume publishes it. 
It is supported by the Lithuanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the U.S. Embassy in Vilnius, although it, uh, according to them, has complete editorial independence. Mm. And it's an interesting publication in that it is peer-reviewed as a journal, but when I was reading through all the articles, they're more opinion pieces, they're more analysis uh, all by experts. So yeah. most of them are political scientists, economists, uh, social theorists, and they're giving kind of a, a contemporary view of Lithuania's foreign policy environment mm -hmm. uh, and on a range of particular specialist subjects. So, mm -hmm. for example, uh, there was one that I found really interesting on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and, and the kind of agreement that Germany was entering into with the United States. Uh, there was uh, some really interesting things about Germany's new sort of foreign policy as we move from Angela Merkel era into a new era. Uh, uh, there was the military alliance between Russia and Belarus mm -hmm. and the kind of ZARP had exercises that occur between those two countries like what is the nature of that military to military partnership to what extent is belarus dependent on russia and so forth and what are the the inner workings of that military relationship uh, and of course there was a lot on lithuania's current um, sort of tensions with china mm -hmm. and multiple perspectives on that not least of which was an interview at the very start with landsbergis the foreign minister of uh, Lithuania and of all the different contributions I think that was the most revealing which is extremely rare in a politician right like you get uh, all these opinion pieces where academics who can speak freely and give their honest views but don't have much sort of political constituency or influence uh, that it can be useful for information but isn't necessarily guidance on what the foreign policy is whereas when the foreign minister speaks that is the foreign policy policy of the country and in this case he went into considerable detail so i'll leave a link in the description i do encourage you to go read that interview and then you'll naturally flow on to some of the other um, thought pieces uh, but that interview landsbergers really lays out a worldview which is which is interesting and under considered so on the one hand he gives you would sort of say a liberal worldview that uh there is basically institutions, socialization of democracy, rule of law, norms of behavior, rules of the road that gravitate certain countries together. Yeah. And yet he puts it in a realist framework, which I really appreciate and find refreshing, i.e. that uh, he recognizes that the United States has military priorities in the Asia Pacific, mm -hmm. but that has strategic implications for Lithuania, that if Lithuania wants to uh, be relevant to the United States, it has to account for those needs, that Lithuania's foreign policy, which is values based, is based in also in its own national interest relative to in its current fight with China. Mm -hmm. And so on the one hand, you could say Lithuania, because this is a question I have myself. Lithuania's foreign policy and its current um, issue with China, on the one hand, is it more that Lithuania's personal experience of occupation and foreign intervention and suppression under uh, Soviet dictatorship mm. has motivated this, or is it a realisation that Lithuania has a deep-seated strategic relationship with the United States, a dependence on the United mm. States, whether it be in the NATO framework, uh, whether it be not being forgotten and, and left high and dry in the far east of, of Europe mm. when uh, Russia and the US are negotiating, uh, and therefore that is motivating Lithuania to do things to put itself on the map vis-a-vis -vis the United States, given that its bilateral trade with China is quite low. These, these are things that have been bubbling away in my own mind. Wait, so you're saying that, like, on one hand, you know, is it because, yeah, of the Soviet occupation that motivated Lithuania to act... Um, in the way that in it has visited Taiwan and China. Taiwan to China, or mm -hmm. is it because they want to re like make sure that their foreign policy aligns with the US so they're not forgotten and they will continue to get military support had there be any um, tension in that region like Belarus, Russia and it, Exactly right. Okay. Yeah, exactly right. Like is and, and so it's more the thought process. Is it rooted in identity and culture and history? Yeah. Or is it rooted in strategy? analysis and interest okay 
And Landsbergis weaves this together in that interview in a very synergistic way, yeah. right? Uh, it, 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 which I think is is a quite a total worldview, mm. uh, and I really appreciated that. So he, it, it's rare to see. What I'm saying is, it's rare to see someone's honest thoughts. Yeah. So the way that Landsbergis lays out Lithuania's foreign mm. policy in the context of a global environment and national strategy. Uh, just in a few words, um, I found quite useful. And he points to problems as well. Uh, for example, the AUKUS arrangements where Australia, the UK and the United States uh, have made a deal to acquire um, nuclear submarines for Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, look, that's a good deal, but the way in which it was done was deeply harmful, i.e. the French were left high and dry, and this is creating problems in other kinds of ways, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when it comes to European solidarity. Mm -hmm. and, and so he, he recognises the missteps and the advantages. So I'm, I'm starting to have a lot of respect for this guy, to be honest. I think he uh, he's a deep thinker, uh, and when he gives an interview... He wasn't just doing what most politicians do, which is read the government talking points, not answer the question that's being asked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, like, do you believe in democracy? Yes, we believe in democracy. Are you against Lukashenko? Lukashenko has stolen the election. Landsberg gives sophisticated answers to these, these questions. Uh, so that's good. So go read that. Mm. Um, and again, thank you, Vitutis, for pointing me in that direction because I wouldn't have seen it otherwise. And uh, there are other think tank pieces as well. The only one that I kind of criticise would be the one by uh, Miss Taylor Valley, which is clearly a, an act of partisanship. Um, so she wrote something kind of attacking Trump and the Republicans and, and saying that Biden was the second coming of Jesus and so forth. So I was like, well, <laughs> the, 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 clearly that's not a rigorous analysis of uh, American foreign policy in Eastern Europe. But I can understand in the context of a new president, mm -hmm. uh, you've got the publication being supported, of course, by the State Department. Um, therefore, you want to have something that's praising the current administration. Yeah. Uh, it there. was overly positive, that opinion piece of saying that there's hope and for, you know, to uh, mitigate war. And that. it was. It, well, it was ridiculous. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to be too mean but it was clearly ridiculous it was saying that trump was kowtowing before dictators and so on and that, that's a narrative that isn't based in fact mm -hmm. uh, and then there is uh but biden has had taken a strong principled stance and stood up to putin in the fiercest way i'm like but biden can't walk up the stairs let alone stand up to putin i mean it's it's i i find <laughs> i just like <laughs> biden <laughs> I, it, it just i i but people have their opinions and, and clearly she is a committed Democrat and that's perfectly fine. Like she should be out there fighting for her, her party and her mm. position. Uh, so I don't have any criticism of her mm. doing that. Uh, but I would say that the quality of the analysis relative to the other, you know, academics and researchers and credential people mm. who um, were, were providing their area of expertise and mm. viewpoints uh, that, that wasn't of the same caliber. But there's like 10 other pieces in that review, which are very much worth your time. So mm. go check it out. I'll leave the link straight to it. And maybe we will go see uh, the Center of Eastern European Studies when we go over there eventually, um, because it would be great to, to see some of these people face to face. Can I just comment on just how I was just genuinely surprised of your commentary in the alignment with some of these people <laughs> like are you friends with these people <laughs> like oh uh, that, yeah that's so, what shocked me i was like do all foreign policy thinkers think like that <laughs> like yeah uh, you make a good point so so charlene and i kind of obviously compared notes uh before coming on here to discuss this review because there's a lot to read and one thing that charlene said was you know, Crispin, your viewpoints align so strongly with these these commentators. And one should always remember the bias of any publication. So they're saying, look, you know, editorial independence, no oversight and control. Yes, but it is sponsored by the Ministry of Lithuanian Foreign Affairs mm. and the, the US um, State Department, which means that it is likely to reflect broadly speaking, <clears throat> the biases of those institutions because otherwise why would they choose to support it? Yeah. Uh, that said, um, 
again, I was surprised by the sophistication of Gabrielis uh, Landsbergis in that interview at the beginning. And so we do see things similarly uh, in a foreign policy sense. The, the difference between me and I think most Lithuanians, although some of the people on the channel have commented and, and modified my my view, I thought it was pretty much everyone thought this way, I don't think they do, but is that I don't have any intrinsic dislike of Russia. Mm -hmm. I have a dislike of the government and the way in which it's conducting its foreign policy and that it's doing things in a short-sighted way that is undermining their own long-term national interests. But I, but I, I actually quite appreciate many things about Russia and I've been there before and I'll go there again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that was different. But, that, but it's clear that uh, that's not the case for, for many commentators as well. They say, look, you know, we, um, we want to have a better relationship with Russia. Uh, we're not prisoners of history. Mm. We don't want to forever be um, obsessing about the injustices under the Soviet occupation. But until such time as the Russians are willing to have an open dialogue about it mm. uh, and actually deal with history in a kind of real way, mm. it's hard for us to tackle it and move on. Yeah, uh, this I, is, I just feel like there's, like, as I read the articles, I kind of felt there's like a layer of like sense of distrust still. Oh, immense distrust. Like... Immense dislike, intrinsic thing. But but yeah, I mean, I look, I mean, one of the reasons, I, it's, it, on the other hand, it's not that surprising I agree with these people. We have this channel called Baltic World. It reflects my appreciation of the fact that I like this part of the world. And I, I kind of tend to agree with a lot of the things that these people say and believe. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and, I, and I do credit Eastern Europe and, and the Baltic region in particular for being the custodians of Western civilization in the modern day. Uh, so if you were to say, you go back to the 19th century, you might say the British Empire was custodians of Western culture in both its positive and negative aspects. Um, but it was certainly, you know, the, you had the best uh, museums, the best literature, the best you know, thinking, the best, you know, all, all of that stuff coming out of the UK. Um, and then if you could say that the United States sort of assumed that role in the post-Second World War era just because of the enormity of its power and, and size. Mm. Uh, and it had the advantage of, of this uh, constitution that enshrined individual liberty and freedom of speech uh, and that this was held up as a uh, aspiration in opposition to Marxist, Leninism, communism that it was competing against. So there was a strong national incentive within the United States to live up to those ideals because mm -hmm. it was trying to export them to the rest of the world. But then if you fast forward to the internet age, the social media age, tech giants, suppression of free speech, censorship, the resurging views of like, uh, let's say, neo-Marxist, neo-socialist, um, communist viewpoints, uh, the um, what we might call woke, right, uh, then... We and the, and the re racialization of society. So no longer is the Martin Luther King ideal of living in a colorblind society where people are treated by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. That that being completely torn up and and mm. we regressing. I think the um, Eastern Europeans, the Northern Europeans, the Baltics are the ones that are still the carrying the torch for. You know, it actually does matter, like the way in which you export your ideals mm. and the way in which like individuals are treated with human rights, dignity and respect and that people have the right to express themselves and to choose their own leaders and, and if they have a view, even if it's a socially uh, atypical view, to be able to express that without mm. being persecuted without being cancelled or losing their job or deplatformed. I think these types of things are held in that region and reflected by the fact that some of the best cultural things are coming out of that region. Yeah, my, my view is that um, that it's, it's not surprising that I align so closely with, with these views because they are not new, they're classical views, um, but they're just the only ones still adhering to them. <laughs>
It was also mentioned in the foreign policy uh, review paper about how Lithuania's foreign policy is values based, mm-hmm. and which we've mentioned before on this channel. But the president, uh, Norzeda, is in the spotlight a bit because he has somehow backflipped from the idea of having a embassy in um, a ta- Taiwan named embassy yep. to rename it as Taipei. Mm-hmm. Why? <laughs> like, And for him to also comment that he had no idea of the naming and the conflicts that they had with China. That, that just vulgared my mind a bit. Well, it's a clear lie. It would be a lie, yeah, right? I mean, we, there's, there's, no, there's no point labeling it anything else. Uh, of course, you don't go into something as plainly fraught as uh, having a, a special relationship with Taiwan, mm. knowing that it aligns with your foreign kind of policy views, uh, and it's going to get the backs of the Chinese mainland up. And then only say that you are misled uh, or misinformed about it eight weeks after the it's thing is opened. Happened. Yeah, I mean th- that is that is a walk back that is very hard to to pull off. Uh, so, I, but to answer your question, I think there are. Uh, What's the motivators? Is because of like the sanctions that China has, like not being able like export Lithuanian beer or something like that. I think that was mentioned too. So there's a question for Norzada himself to make those statements. And then there's the broader question of whether a values-based foreign policy is a sound approach to foreign policy for a country like Lithuania. Mm. And when we come to the the micro, Norzada's own decision, it's almost certainly a political calculus. He thinks that he's going to get more support domestically Mm -hmm. by standing in opposition to uh, Landsbergis and the uh, Samus uh, and, the, and the current government in power. Some of the people in the comments section on that video pointed out that he ran against uh, Ingrida Simonite, who's the current prime minister, for the presidency and, and beat her in a runoff. And then that's created a lot of bad blood between those, those characters. So what we have is the sort of semi-presidential system in Lithuania where the government is run out of the Samus but the president is the head of state representing Lithuania abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have them in political differences between the president and, in this case, the foreign minister, which is a rare situation, like I mentioned in the video, in which their political interests don't align. Mm -hmm. You know, just because uh, Lance Burgess gets voted out doesn't mean Norzada gets voted out and vice versa, whereas if you're in Australia... Well, if your political get, <laughs> if your political party gets voted out, you're you're all out of government. So you've yeah. got a clear interest to work together. Is there an advantage to that? I don't think there is an advantage to that if they if they have different viewpoints, especially if it's in the foreign policy space. I have to think about that more. Um, uh, I'm sure there are benefits, uh, but at the moment we're seeing the drawbacks. Um, mm. So I'd have to. Cons- it's a good question. It's a really good question. What what are the comparative advantages of a semi presidential system? Where you know the president can't just fire the the foreign minister. Like mm. in in the United States, for example, you also directly elect the president of the United States, while uh, the majority in Congress passes most legislation. So you've got the legislature in Congress and mm-hmm. the executive in the presidency. The difference there is that the president personally appoints his cabinet, including the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. So he can fire them whenever he likes. If Biden wants to fire Antony Blinken, he just can do that and replace him. And Trump did this regularly, too regularly. Uh, And so their their interest of like the the foreign minister is going to, well, in this case, the US Secretary of State is going to reflect the views of the the president. president. Uh, If he doesn't do that, he's not going to be Secretary of State. As we saw with... um, Trump and his first Secretary of State, uh, the gas executive, can't remember his name, uh, Rex Tillerson. Uh, he, he didn't remain long because they didn't agree on, on foreign policy issues. Mm. Um, so there's that issue where the domestic politics of Lithuania has spilled out into the open foreign domain. And this is incredibly destructive, like I say in this video, because it's something that's easy to exploit. China can come out and praise Norzada. China itself could pour money into Norzada's like election campaign and mm. and and 
if uh, Norzada has these companies within Lithuania that support his position and they publicly support his position, China might allow their goods to come in and, and keep oh everybody else. Gosh, like you could so start to see how this kind of disharmony in Lithuania could, could cause the whole thing to crumble. We're not at that stage yet. But that's the danger of having a, like a your internal laundry being aired uh, in, in a global well, scale. Well, it would have a bigger um, influence because the population difference is massive. <laughs> it's ginormous. Like, comparatively to China and Lithuania. Like, it'd have a big influence if you have, you know, these co- companies, Lithuania, being able to trade in China. Huge disadvantage there. Massive. And that brings us to the values-based foreign policy question. It's almost the only country that has walked the walk on this. Hmm. There is a a saying in Australian politics, only the impotent are pure, right? Which means that if you have no political power or influence at all, you can afford to be more ideologically uh, correct. We have like the Greens Party in Australia... Uh, they are always like more action on climate change, more action on you know pacifism, more action on growing trees and stuff. And whatever figure the government comes out with, they'll be like triple it, quadruple it, you know, yeah. in, in, increase pay, increase this. Uh, and so they're always saying things that are playing to their base and playing to that to that segment of the population mm. because they're never going to be in government ever. Okay. Mm. Once they're in government and they have multiple constituencies they have to satisfy, then you have to compromise, mm. right? That's the nature of, of democracy and politics and uh, one of the differences between a majoritarian system and a proportional system because the proportional system you're negotiating with parties whereas uh, majority systems you're negotiating with electors, right? Uh, and that, thus that, that, whole, that whole statement sort of says that people, they can say they have a values-based foreign policy, but they tend to pick and choose what those values are to be emphasised mm-hmm. and uh, where they apply them. And the, the the kind of phrase that I give when I'm trying to destroy people who believe in liberal foreign policy or constructivism is say, the day that Norway marches troops into Tibet and frees the monks from communist dictatorship rule, mm. I, I believe that uh, power doesn't set norms. But at the moment, the, uh, the people that have the most ability to, to impose their values-based foreign policy on the world are those mm. with the most national power. And the way to accumulate and maintain national power is usually to ignore values, right? For example, the United States went into Iraq, supposedly for WMD and supposedly for the 9-11 mm-hmm. attacks, neither of which were, were relevant to Iraq. But once there, they fell in love with their own legend that they could yeah. rebuild Iraq and turn it into a flourishing modern democracy, much like the United States. And when they went in there, they were completely deluded about what would happen. They thought everyone's going to to come out and, and kiss all the troops for liberating them from this evil dictator. No, they I, became highly dependent. <laughs> Yeah, and it became open urban warfare and thousands of people died and trillions of dollars spent and, and not much to show for it. Uh, and that's because the Americans thought they had such power that and that their cause was so correct mm. that they couldn't fail, that this was, of course, what would happen. And instead what they did is they exhausted an enormous proportion of their national power and wealth mm. in these foreign misadventures we see the total failure in afghanistan for yeah. example the loss the the military loss even um with taliban reasserting control like we don't have the bath party back in iraq but we do have the taliban back in afghanistan that's how much of a failure it has been and so most countries don't pick fights with superpowers mm-hmm. over the sake of their own morality Except Lithuania has. It's a really interesting um, test case. It sounds terrible, but it's because because of Lithuania's size, they have, quote-unquote, less to lose. Or am I being... It's not because of Lithuania's size. They had less to lose because they don't have a strong economic dependence on China. 
Oh, okay. So, for example, this is a really good point. The Americans will go in and pick fights with Iran, mm-hmm. right? Because Iran can't attack the United States directly, can mm-hmm. attack Israel, but not the United States. And uh, the Iranians have almost no economic trade with the United States. Mm, so if the United okay. States wants to stand up for human rights, well, Iran is an easy target, right? They don't sure. have much to lose. Um, whereas if the United States wants to uh, say that Taiwan is an independent country or recognize them as an independent country, well, they're starting a war with a superpower. Okay? Mm, I can and, see that because with Australia being like, we need to find the source of, of, of this pandemic and or speaking about outwards about Taiwan and then China hitting back with tariffs on that grain and um, exports. So, yeah, okay, I can kind of see it. Yeah, now China has gone about this in a self-destructive way. If you are so powerful mm. that, and, and Lithuania, tiny, tiny place by comparison, if that tiny place does something to irritate you, you have some options. One, you can destroy them which is what China is trying to do. Mm. Or you can say basically that Lithuania is so tiny and so insignificant that they don't even notice that this has happened, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And what I would have done if I was... Let's say I'm in the Chinese Politburo Mm -hmm. and I think what Lithuania has done is outrageous. They're undermining our one China policy and national thing and yeah. Taiwan's part of China, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to make sure that other countries don't go down Lithuania's path, mm. right? Well, I don't have public histrionics about it, right? And make everyone draw attention to this issue and make it look like that this big giant power is bullying this poor innocent little democracy. Mm. What I do is I very quietly punish Lithuania and do it all under the radar so that the Lithuanians know, but I have total plausible deniability in public. I don't come out and make public statements about it. I simply say, look, we didn't even notice what Lithuania's thing with um, Taipei is, mm. and you know they want to have their negotiations and trade. Um, that's, that's fine. But the subtext message would be there is a price to pay for undermining our national interest, right? Mm. What China has done has gone one step further than that. And they've entered a realm of mercantilism, which hasn't existed for hundreds of years. So when Genoa and Venice were competing as city-states, they would secure trade rights with various um, ports around the Mediterranean. And one of their kind of uh, trade like requirements is that you couldn't deal trade with the other, mm-hmm. okay? Um, and that meant that uh, their competition was basically economic. You would strangle the other the other side. Uh, we the whole reason Napoleon invaded Russia was because Napoleon had previously secured a peace deal with Russia, mm-hmm. and one of the provisions of that peace deal was that Russia could not uh, supply English ships in its ports. Right, mm. and Russia was ignoring that provision and allowing English ships to get supplies, timber, uh, you know, repairs, all of that stuff, which Napoleon found intolerable. Mm. Okay, uh, so this whole squeezing you like you and I can have a relationship, but you cannot have a relationship with this other person. Yeah. Like think about your own personal relationships, and when like you, you're you have a um, you know, a partner, and they say you can't be friends with X, Y, or Z, right? Like that, it's that type of thing, but on an international scale. Yeah. China is now doing that with all these other businesses with whom it has uh, economic influence, right? Mm. Uh, and they're saying, look, if you do a business with Lithuania, we will cut you out of our market, we'll cut you out of our capital, uh, you won't have Chinese customers, you won't have Chinese materials. Uh, you won't be able to buy anything from our country. You won't be able to travel here. What's the purpose of China's like public retaliation though? Like it's so big. <laughs> Is it an ego thing? <laughs> well, uh, it's it's to you know shoot one to scare a hundred, right? right. Like. It, what China is afraid of is that every country develops a values-based foreign policy, right? Because if all these other countries work in solidarity mm. and go, look what's happened to Lithuania. 
uh, we understand with Lithuania, then China collapses essentially because it, it it's not it's it's super strong that relative to any one country can absolutely dominate, mm-hmm. but relative to the entire world, China cannot have the rest of the world united against it. It's not strong enough for that. And Lithuania is the canary in the coal mine here, where uh, so it's, it's slightly different to to the spat with Australia. China China has a spat with Australia because Australia has done a few things that China doesn't like, and mm. is uh, and this is sort of spun out of control. Whereas Lithuania is saying, "This is who we are. This is what we believe, and this is why we're doing this." Mm. Um, it's a much more open challenge to the whole communist uh, kind of legitimacy so look you're an authoritarian dictatorship we don't deal with authoritarian dictatorships uh neither should anyone else and we're going to reflect that by supporting the people you're trying to oppress okay Mm -hmm. it's a very open challenge right if other countries take that up Mm -hmm. then china is in real trouble so by coming down on lithuania like a ton of bricks that from the chinese point of view will prevent others from daring to go down the same path and it, I think Norzada's uh, decision to publicly criticise this foreign policy is really harmful to Lithuania uh, because it creates this discord. Like if Lithuania managed to hold the line mm-hmm. and stand firm on this, then it really forces the EU into a corner because the EU exists to provide a collective power mm. to individual member states. So it's not Hungary or uh, Portugal, you know, cannot stand up to China, but collectively they're supposed to be able to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the EU's economy is still bigger than China's, right? So as a whole, they could say, no, you're, you're victimising a democratic member state mm-hmm. And we've decided that we too are going to have a values-based foreign policy and we're all going to recognise Taiwan and allow them to have a you know, re- trade representation office in any one of our member states. Where does that leave China? Mm. The fact that this kind of buckling is going on within Lithuania makes that solidarity more difficult because you don't even have national solidarity. Yeah. Uh, and China could win. And it would be very, very harmful if China wins. Why, why did you say that you, you'd rec- if you were in China's position, you would have rather, you know, put all these um, sanctions under the radar? Like, why wouldn't you make it more public like China has? Because multiple reasons. You, you look smaller okay. if you show yourself to be afraid of a tiny, tiny country like Lithuania. Like, if you pretend like you don't even notice that Lithuania exists, okay, mm. uh, then you are showing your own greatness. You're like, there is a massive disparity between us and them. Yeah. Uh, and you don't look like you're easily rattled by things. Mm. Like, you know, a country does something somewhere in the world that's offensive to China. Why should I care? I'm China. I can't even hear you over the noise of our own power, right? Mm. Um, the... Uh, so in that instance, there is like just a, a exaltation projection that's relevant. But beyond that, in terms of efficacy, if a country is publicly saying Lithuania is our enemy, we're going to destroy them, then you do put people in a camp, right? Mm. But if you say... Lithuania, I can't can't even hear what they're doing. I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't looked into it. No one's briefed me on what's going on in Lithuania. Uh, I mean, where is Lithuania? Like, can you point it out to me? I'll I'll I'll, I'll ask some of my attaches to look into it, and I'll get back to you in six months. Right? Mm-hmm. If you if you put it in those terms, yeah, then you're not forcing the world to pick a side, right? Uh... Yeah, yeah, and and all you're seeing is Lithuania's economy suffering and their businesses suffering because they've taken on china Mm. without turning this into an epoch uh like us versus the world democracy versus authoritarianism clash which china itself has done they're basically saying we're going to destroy taiwan so we're we're, we're saying that too we're going (laughs) we're going to destroy lithuania 
uh, because we, you know, are, are authoritarian dictatorship. We believe, we believe this, this, and this, which is totally antithetical to not only what Lithuania believes, but what most of the world believes. Mm. Uh, and thus, it does push people into those camps, mm. you know. Uh, but if China denies, like, any repercussion against Lithuania uh, and said that they didn't even notice, et cetera, et cetera, um, then the Lithuanians will know that they're being punished. Mm -hmm. um, but it won't galvanize a global effort to, to stand up for Lithuania. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in that respect, I do admire China for being so public about it because before we, yeah, before we talked about Lithuania, but, oh, no one will watch Lithuania. And suddenly <laughs> Lithuania is on the global stage. <laughs> Yeah, we do have a lot to thank China uh, we for, do. <laughs> for, for making Baltic world much more relevant uh, because, yeah, I mean, before I was wondering how to, to persuade people where, that Ooh. Lithuania is important, etc. cetera, and, uh, and clearly the Politburo agrees. Um, yes, mm. China's just done it for us, which <laughs> is great. Uh, changing topic, I want to mm -hmm. move back to Australia. So Australia's in the headlines because we have a famous tennis player, Novak Djokovic, on our shores. Oh, <laughs> I have a lot to say about this one. So there's a lot of controversy because he uh, wanted to compete in the Australian Open and claimed that he had a vaccination exemption. Uh, a lot of people jumped on this because apparently uh, you're not allowed to come into Australia unless you are vaccinated with a valid exemption. And the border forces were like, we don't have that yet. Um, the Australian Open claimed that they had that kind of evidence and they've been investigating so far that we know at this point in time is that uh, he was granted exemption on the basis that he already contracted COVID-19 six months prior to being in Australia, um, not a medical exemption like um, anaphylaxis, for instance. So, but according to the border forces, they're saying that that's actually not a valid exemption based on the TGA advice that is, um, that's not a, yeah. So... <sighs> It's such a nightmare. It uh, is, right? <laughs> uh, like Australia is totally in the wrong. Like it's hard to be it's hard to be more in the wrong because there's a, there is what Charlene has laid out as kind of a narrative of who's saying what, but there is a political narrative. Okay, he'd entered the country mm. and was ready to play, and it was only when there was a massive public backlash saying. Why is this elite athlete getting special treatment? I, you know, my my husband, my uh, granddaughter, my whatever can't come into the country because they're not vaccinated, uh, and I haven't been able to see them. Why are we mm -hmm. giving special treatment to this tennis player? This was the thing, and and hundreds of thousands of people were complaining about this because they were in their minds going, how could he have a, a valid exemption? He's a world-class athlete. What's the problem with him getting vaccinated? Mm. Okay, so huge undeserved. public outcry. Yeah. The government suddenly decides to, despite the fact that independent panels and stuff had reviewed this and whatever, uh, the government has decided, no, we, we don't have the right paperwork, okay? We're going to ex ex kick him out, you know, do the right thing, you know. Now, what they expected to happen was that Novak Djokovic would go to the airport, get on a plane... And leave. And leave. <laughs> yeah. and, com and complain that, you know, he'd be mistreated or whatever and do that from overseas mm. uh, where he could be on his luxury yacht and, and all of the rest of it and live his, good, his perfect life but away from Australia and not the Australian Open. That's what the government expected and took a political calculus, in my opinion, that uh, it was going to be popular in Australia to do that. Novak Djokovic, God bless him, said, I'm not just getting on this thing. You can throw me in this cell. I'm going to fight this, right? Mm. I'm being mistreated. And in my opinion, absolutely is being mistreated for many reasons. First of all, there are other people that have medical exemptions that are not in the public headlines, Okay. Uh, and I don't want to go to too far down this on, on YouTube, but it's, you know, obviously the thing that has made this a worldwide news story is that he's the number one tennis seed mm. and is currently in detention. 
Yeah. And and the thing is, there are definitely other people that have been granted exemptions, but they're not in the headlines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's just so. So there's the the specific treatment that mm. Djokovic is receiving. That's one issue. Another issue is whose responsibility is this? I feel like the responsibility is just kind of boop, 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 boop. your fault, your fault. <laughs> like, oh, the, the different jurisdictions, the different organisations are all blaming each other. Um, it is clearly the Australian government's fault, right? <laughs> if Novak Djokovic had lied, if he said, I have a vaccination, mm. and then it's discovered that he, he lied to get entry into Australia, Obviously, he should be prosecuted and held out, right? Yeah. But he was completely upfront from all the evidence that I've seen that, mm. you know, he had uh, res- had the pandemic previously, therefore he had antibodies. You could test for those antibodies. Mm. Therefore, he had a natural immunity. And, and on top of that, uh, you then have to weigh the risk to him as an individual for receiving a vaccine, although the risk is extremely small. Um, you know, you have to weigh that as, for, as medical professionals against mm. the risk to the public by the fact that he's already had the disease and developed his own antibodies, right? Well, my, my gripe was that he went through all the right things. Like he followed Tennis Australia's, like the organisation that he was liaising with is nationally. Mm. So he's like, okay, you need to be vaccinated to enter this country or these are the exemptions that we will allow based on you know, the requirements of Australia, right? You'd think someone would cross-check that. And then you also think that the border forces would cross-check each individual on their exemption. Like like the fact that he got landed in Australia without a proper medical exemption is a failure, I think, on the border forces. Like they hadn't done their job properly. Yeah, you know, that's and, correct. Like he, they... he was misinformed. Like how can like how can you blame someone that was misinformed? They did all the right things. Oh yeah. And there were Yes, absolutely. And as you said before, there are other people who have similar exemptions, let's say, who are in the community. So the border force are responsible for all the people in the community who have arrived from overseas, right? Mm. There is a gate you go through, immigration, where they check all this stuff. And if you go past those gates, that's on them, right? Yeah. Um, unless you have lied and deceived and forged your way, whatever it is that... that if you have been honest, well, that's on. It's clearly there. Like, should Novak Djokovic play in the Australian Open? Of course, he should be playing in the Australian Open. It'd be really great to see him, and I, and I really hope that he wins his legal challenges. So instead of uh, you know being thrown off overseas, he has um, chosen to fight this, and I think that's quite a remarkable thing for someone in his position and what he stands to lose to do. I think that's a really noble act uh, to stand up for his personal rights, and even being locked away and separate from all of his, his personal luxuries to which he would no doubt be accustomed. Uh, he's not allowed to train, which is going to be really detrimental going into a Grand Slam tennis tournament. Uh, and he doesn't have his personal chef. And people, people in Australia have been really kind of obnoxious about this, like, oh, who needs a personal chef? He's the world number one tennis player, which means that his diet is going to be strictly planned. Mm. Uh, he's going to be, he's going to have an expert providing him his meals that align with a very strict set of criteria of nutrients and volume and mm. the way it's prepared and et cetera, et cetera, yeah. to make sure that he can operate optimally mm. in a incredibly competitive environment. So people think of like, oh, he's got his own chef as if like, He's just going. I mean, do you think he can't afford good food, right? Like, if he, he doesn't need his own chef for that reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, if he wants to get the best possible cuisine, he in wants Australia, to be number one, world right? class. He's <laughs> yeah. world class in every respect. Yeah, but it's not the, the guy is not doing that because he's pampered. He's doing that because he's disciplined. Yeah, uh, and so yeah, all of that. Um, now, from the latest news. Uh, the courts are, are going to hear it. The um, the Australian government did a, apply to the courts to have the whole thing delayed. Uh, the courts have rejected that. So we will get um, a resolution on this mm. and hopefully the courts will get to the bottom of what really happened because all of the different organisations are blaming each other yeah. and they're all pointing at Novak saying he's a terrible person, get him out of here. That's mm. clearly not true. Mm. Uh, now, the only argument... 
on the other side is to say, well, you know, we have these rules. They're not um, necessarily fair in every individual case. But, you know, if you make an allowance for one, then you might have to make an allowance for everybody. Uh, I don't think it. I mean, that's, that's as strong an argument as I can make. Mm. But given this is clearly a mess up by Australian officials and Novak doesn't seem to have done anything wrong other than to not be vaccinated. Um, what, what, what's the, what's the, and also just the objective, what's the risk? Like he clearly wouldn't be allowed in if he had the disease. He mm. doesn't. So how is he a risk to anybody? Like mm. he's not infected. He's got antibodies. Mm. I think a lot of this is because in Australia there is such demonization of people who haven't been vaccinated. Yeah, and I think that's what's the biggest thing that's disappointed me throughout this whole story is the response to this, not the actual story itself, but the response in the story. Like I'm reading the comments of like, yeah, good on him, deport him, and like how dare he, I like, flaunt the rules, I haven't seen my family in like years and all these things you know like of course it's the wealthy that get pampered and get these exemptions i'm like no not necessarily like it's just convenient to demonize people who yeah are framed in this way um and his wife says something really touching she's just like i mean i don't necessarily agree with everything she said but she said you know he's a human being right yeah. like he's not you know, he's, he's, he's Novak Djokovic, but he's a person. He's a person, know? yeah. You know? uh, and the way in which he's been treated is is in incredibly, incredibly dark. And, and as you say, reflects a, a broader culture in which, like the thing that I'm ashamed of is that the, the, uh, the culture has been affected in such a way that treating him in this way has social and political currency. Um, yeah. Like it, it, the, the fact that the entire country is an outraged mm. um, in shows where we are um, in yeah. terms of treating people who are not part of the who are of the of, of the unwashed, undesirable subversives. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, it was so interesting, right? So obviously, my background's public health, <laughs> and I followed a few pages. I, I'd covered this story, and these pages they they pride themselves to be evidence-based and open-minded and encouraging different ideas, but they were naming and shaming this individual, just one individual not knowing anything about the, about um, tennis Australia and like the mix up and, and the misinformation carried forward, you know, making like demonizing him. Right. And I was just like, wow, that's disappointing. And I like, made a bit of a comment being like, I don't see anything wrong if he had followed the right protocol, <laughs> if he'd followed the right protocol, then there's something else that's happened. Um, and, you know, I kind of wanted to follow up on these pages. And after that, the mix up and the the courts now um, being carried through, nothing, zero, no accountability, no like being like, oh, maybe we're actually wrong. <laughs> maybe this, this is actually more complicated than we think it is, <laughs> than just simply this individual wanted to flaunt the rules. Like, <laughs> And this makes me so disappointed. I'm like, how, how did we get here? Like, you know, as the media, it's just, are they so bored to just curate all these big stories of like these individual cases? It is just, I don't know. I'm just absolutely fatigued, Crispin. Like, I just think that um, there are bigger problems out there. Um, and I had this other comparison the other day. I was saying, like, why are we focused on an individual that's in a hotel, you know, going through this court case when there's all these people that are um, homeless or all these people that um, are refugees waiting to come out? <laughs> like, it, there's just other issues, but the media decides to centre on a world-class tennis player. Um, <sighs> like, yeah, I mean, there's the... Like in in pointing out like how we got here, think about where else, what else is happening. So in the Northern Territory, which is an area of a like a geographical area, think of a state similar to that uh, of the US. In one of on one of these places, everyone who 
does not have the full vaccination mm -hmm. is under house arrest. Okay. That means they cannot, they can leave home for three reasons. They can go to get vaccinated. They can uh, go for essential groceries and food. Uh, and they can look after someone who can't look after themselves, like a dependent. Mm. Uh, they can't travel beyond 30 kilometers of their home for any reason. And they can't work. They can't work. They can't exercise. They are stuck at home because they have been unwilling to undergo a voluntary medical procedure. Now, before I go on, I am a strong advocate for getting vaccinated. I'm vaccinated. Charlene's vaccinated. There's like the, the ill effects were, were absolutely trivial from, from our experiences. Uh, and the, the risk is gradually outweighed from what I can tell of the medical benefit of being inoculated against this pandemic, right? Um, so I would encourage people to do that. But I would never force anyone mm. to do that. It's, it goes against all kinds of biomedical ethics. And the fact that, that politicians have managed to demonise people who seek to assert sovereignty over their own bodies in a way that is different from them uh, and have been so successful as you can implement a totalitarian prison state upon a group of people that have committed no crime mm. uh, is extraordinary, is extraordinary. And, and the fact that we are in this situation uh, and we have to be careful what we say on social media about this and mm. YouTube and so on uh, is, is, is amazing. How, yeah, like, how, how did we get here? And, and the, the terrible question that I ask myself and I don't have a good answer for is how do we find our way back? How do we get back to the, the great utopian Australia that uh, I, I firmly believed in prior to all this beginning? Uh, because it's not, it's not a place that I understand anymore. Mm, mm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it, 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 it is. <laughs> I don't want to end the week in a review like this, but it's like... Oh, like lots of people have different medical procedures in their life, right? And for some reason, this particular one needs to be disclosed to the world. <laughs> like it's it's crazy. Well, um, one good thing, okay, that if we're going to have, is that Australia is now, and this is going to sound weird as a good thing, but it is a good thing. Australia is like the now the number one uh, pandemic hotspot on earth, right? We've, we've New South Wales today recorded like a hundred thousand new cases. Uh, mm. and Australia only has 26 million people. Um, whole areas of the country are yet to be touched by it so that they will also um, experience massive, overwhelming infection. Um, and, and when this is just spiralled out of control mm. to the point where people can no longer fear it because they're so used to it, like familiarity breeds contempt, as they say, once you get used to it and you're mm -hmm. like, whatever... So like living with it, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, like once they see it every day, it's not like this boogeyman that's going to get them from under the bed. It's it's something that mm -hmm. they see with their own eyes and they experience themselves and they kind of just get used to the fact that this is a thing uh, and it becomes a new reality. Then perhaps the, the political currency that comes for demonising people and attacking people will begin to dissipate. Uh, and we will get back a sense of our own humanity and, and society and social bonds. Mm -hmm. That's that's my hope, um, but can't guarantee that. But it is it is a like it is a positive that that now it's no longer this external threat that we're always guarding against. It's something that's here and now is happening to people. Mm -hmm. uh, then, yeah, there's a saying in chess uh, that the threat is often more painful than the execution. Hmm. Um, or as Seneca once said in one of his Stoic writings, we suffer much more in our imagination than we do in reality. Um, and in other words... I totally agree with that. <laughs> yeah, and that, that once it happens, people deal with it. You know? yeah. But the fact that we've been worrying about it for two years uh, has led us to, to where we are. Mm, yeah, no, I agree. No, I agree. I think there's definitely like... <laughs> there's a saying in Buddhism that winter always turns into spring. So... <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, there will be, it will get better. I hope, like, 
<laughs> I will continue to pray. All right, well, I think that's all the time we've got for today. Any questions, any feedback, please leave them down below. Um, like Crispin said, we have Patreon. So if you've been following us for a while and want to contribute, no pressure at all, uh, we'll have that linked as well. Uh, really helps us grow the channel and produce more exciting content. Uh, but anyways, stay safe and... Ciao for now.